Thank you, Rosie. Hello, everyone. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, so my name's Rosanna um, and uh, today's event is a collaboration between the East End Women's Museum and Katie from Look Up London. So for those of you who don't know, the East End Women's Museum seeks to record, research, share and celebrate the stories of East London women, past and present. So if there's any locals here, welcome. Um, and it's the only dedicated women's museum in England and we're soon gonna have a permanent home embarking. So more about that later. And this event is part of our wonderful Women of Newham project. So our wonderful museum volunteers researched uh, the local women who worked in the shop stocks and factories of the East End. Um, and then we designed trails like this. And uh, we did a trail of Canning Town and Silvertown. And so Katie's going to be leading the virtual tour of Silvertown today. Um, and we're delighted to welcome Katie. She's a multi award winning London history blogger and prize winning blue badge tourist guide. And she runs Look Up London, which includes a blog, London walking tours. And incredibly, during the pandemic, has moved on to these virtual tours, um, which we can do from the comfort of our own home, which is wonderful. So um, make sure you're on mute. Um, and if you've got any questions and comments, please pop them in the chat box and we'll get to those. Mute your phone. If you can mute yourself, that would be wonderful as well. Thank you. And over to Katie. Great, thank you, Rosanna. Um, and thanks, Rosie, as well. Welcome, everyone. I'm honestly gobsmacked that so many of you, if you're UK, have taken yourself away from the sunshine and the beer gardens to join me on this virtual tour today. Um, so our, our plan is we're going to be exploring Silvertown, an area in the East End of London. And as Rosanna said, our subject today is really about the, the wonderful women, um, past and present, really, of the East End. So I would encourage you as well. I know we have people joining from all over the world today. So do uh, pop where you're joining in from in the chat box. And if you live in Newham or you're local to Silvertown, or you have memories of Silvertown or some of the places that we're talking about today, that's always fantastic to hear about. So uh, do, do pop it in the chat box as well. So let's start. I'm going to share my screen with you now. And what we'll do is um, about halfway through, I'll have a break in the presentation and come out of the screen sharing just to have a little look at the questions so far, answer any um, and, and give you a chance to top up a drink or something a few minutes and then we'll carry on. But the, the talk should last about just over an hour. So with, this is our sort of vague route today. We're starting just where the red is circled by Canning Town Station, right in the heart of what's known as the Royal Docks, right in the East End of London. And we'll be making our way through Silvertown to North Woolwich um, and ending close to another DLR station. And it's an area that has changed I mean, dramatically doesn't even cut it. Uh, this map view, still with the red dot on the site of Canning Town, shows us this area in 1746. So we're going back quite far, but as you can see, it's all marshland. It's known as the Plasto um, Marshes. And it really took quite a long time to get going in terms of industrial development. Now, right by the red dot, you can see this wiggly line of Bow Creek. And this is really important for the development of the area because past east of Bow Creek was outside a zone determined by law um, where they were allowed to build smelly polluting factories. So in 1844, you have a Metropolitan uh, Building Act that basically regulates industry and heavy uh, smelly polluting industries in central London and the built up areas. But it's kind of a free for all east of Bow Creek um, in this area that we know today as Canning Town, Plasto, East Ham, West Ham, Silvertown. And so this kickstarts a lot of development. So the, 
the first kind of uh, ring of the industrial bell is actually the Victoria docks. The Act of Parliament in 1850 allows them to be built, but it takes a while for them to get going. And actually who sneaks in earlier is a, um, another factory that's set up by Stephen William Silver. And that's actually why we get the name Silver Town. It's after this man who set up a, um, basically a waterproofing factory was using rubber and then expanded um, into Indian rubber works and also telegraph cables. So they would lay submarine uh, cables um, amongst other things along the Atlantic. So a huge factory that was based here and they opened um, in the 1850s, very early 1850s. And then came the Victoria docks. So you can see this patch of um, square blue um, of the Victoria docks here. And really this was transformational for the area. And we will get to women, don't worry, but this context is really important for the story of the area. So when the Victoria docks arrived, they opened in 1855, and you can see the evidence of the change of the growth of the area really in the numbers. So in 1800, the population of this area was about 6,000. And then by 1900, it's almost 300,000. And so there's a huge amount of building. You can see the streets that start to get developed. We're now in 1908. And everyone is uh, living and working in this area and either working in the docks or in the various factories that really are expanding through Silvertown. So these are the people that we're going to meet on our, on our tour today. So without further ado, we'll start at Canning Town Station. And the other thing that you'll see on this tour is that it's brilliant doing it as a virtual tour, actually, because unfortunately, a lot of the historical sites just do not survive today. So if you're walking around the area, it's pretty hard to pick out sites from even 50 years ago. And you get a sense of that as you walk out of Canning Street Station. So you turn around, you can see all of these new high-rise uh, luxury flats being built, um, largely residential for the kind of new East Londoners that work in the city and in um, Canary Wharf um, and who are moving into London um, in search of work and, and new jobs. So we're continuing down Silvertown Way and we're going to branch off the main road to go down a street called Caxton Street. And as well as the residential development, you can also see um, new industrial development as well. This um, iron and yellow panels is a modern um, uh, kind of industrial site, 13 units, workspace, studio space. It's called Caxton Works. And I just thought I'd mention it um, because it's kind of the new rise of industry in this area, um, catering to startups, catering to young professionals who are in smaller companies and are giving them affordable workspace. But if you were to walk in that area today, you'll also spot a curious little sculpture, um, which is, is so playful and wonderful. You can spot a few of these around London by an artist called Alex Chinnick. And um, I think they're brilliant because not only are they fun kind of tying a knot in the post box, but also they're quite anthropomorphic. I mean, he looks quite angry, like he's got his arms crossed. And this just gave me a wonderful excuse to perhaps put in a tenuous link, but to a, a pretty incredible woman who is not that well known. And that is to Nora Willis. And she became the first female postman in 1915. Now she wasn't actually based in the East End, but I couldn't help but mention her. She was actually based in Epsom, um, uh, west of London. 
But she fits into our theme quite nicely because in 1914, when a lot of the working male population are going to fight in the Great War, women are left to fill jobs up and down the country. And on the 27th of December, 1915, Nora signs up to be um, a, a male woman, essentially. And she works there for four and a half years um, and then, from this post, this kind of first working experience, she then gets into local politics and she becomes a counsellor for Ewell and Epsom. And this is a theme, again, that we see throughout the tour today, women who are driven into the workforce and then um, become kind of really enfranchised and want to stand up for themselves and their fellow men and women um, in the workforce as well. So good, good on Nora, I think. Um, so we're going to continue down Caxton Street. And as you can see, um, Really, this area has, has completely changed um, since the Victorian houses and terraces that would have lined this area, and it was heavily damaged during the Second World War and aerial bombing, so it makes it quite hard when we're talking about women from the 19th century to pinpoint exactly where the streets would have been, but if you go along Caxton Street today, which is um, in all honesty, slightly grubby streets just underneath the bypass here. You'll find these industrial units. But if we go back in time and look at a map, you can see Huntingdon Street here. And at number 25, Huntington Street, uh, lived a woman called Martha Little. So you can see today that we're on Caxton Street North. This is a modern day map. And so we're sort of looking towards where Huntington Street would have been today, uh, would have been in the 19th century before it was completely decimated during the Second World War. <clears throat> and Martha Little, um, we don't have a photo of her, unfortunately, but we do have these wonderful illustrations from the East End Women's Museum that help to um, bring the characters to life. But Martha Little um, was born in 1856. She was married. She had seven children, um, which kind of wasn't, wasn't untypical uh, at the time. And her husband was a sawdust and firewood contractor. So he was selling kind of bulk items. And sawdust was really important because it was used for packing ice cubes and ice and keeping things cold in an age where you didn't have ready access to refrigeration. So this might be for households, but also for larger commercial activity near the, near the docks. Now, what's interesting is that um, Martha outlived her husband. And if we go by the official records of 1914, when they list the in the street directories the owners and the business um, kind of holders Martha Little is the sole resident and listed as sawdust contractor so we can assume that she took over the business after her husband died um, and for for a lot of women they couldn't just rely on their husband's income, um, unlike perhaps middle class women in the west of London, the East Enders had to provide joint income and we see this time and time again. So in this area that I've circled here, um, which is close to Huntington Street where we've just seen Martha Little, the red dot in amongst this circled area is a street also now kind of obliterated called Crown Street. And Crown Street and a number of other, other streets in this area that is circled red here was known as draft board or checkerboard alley. And it got that name because of the mixed uh, race population. Um, if you think of the black and white squares on a game board, that is what was reflected in the population. We're right by the docks, which is serving 
international trade and so lots of people from all around the world are settling in London mainly men from North Africa from Indonesia from um, China and they're settling in this area and marrying predominantly white women and there is an incredible photo um, that survives from 1930 of just the most adorable uh, kids all coming out and having their photo taken here. And it really shows you um, the mix of, of children in the area in 1930. Now, um, I'll I'll, I'm going to read to you just a contemporary uh, sort of clipping from the Daily Express, which um, we might find a bit distasteful today, but it, it, it shows you the kind of um, prevalent attitude um, at the time, not of the people who lived in the local area, but of people who were judging from the outside. So in the Daily Express, they have accompanying this photo, a description saying Crown Street, London. To how many is it more than a meaningless name? If anyone has ever heard of it, it is only to know that it is one of the myriad squalid thoroughfares that bisect and intersect the teeming and conglomerate district known vaguely to Londoners as the docks. To those who have more knowledge and perhaps a little sympathetic imagination, it is known as the street of the hopeless children. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like these children don't look hopeless at all. Um, but the prevailing idea at the time was that these children from mixed race families were just not going to be given the best start in life. They were going to face uh, lots of discrimination. And unfortunately, um, there's lots of kind of suggestions in the Daily Express that they are going to hate white people because of this discrimination. So we can always rely on newspapers to be quite divisive, but what do the people who actually lived there at the time, what do they remember? Well, it's actually very different. They talk about how everyone was treated the same in this area and that people mixed along just alongside each other. Um, one, one local woman called Doris, who was interviewed in the 1950s, said everybody in the street used to speak to each other and all the children used to play together. Now, I don't want to overpaint an idealistic view as well, because sadly, in 1919, following the end of this, the First World War with a lot of anger and a lot of built up resentment, um, there were in fact several race riots in the Canning Town Poplar area, as well as in dock areas like Liverpool and Glasgow as well. So it's not always that uh, rosy view um, as well. So all of these issues are, are always more nuanced than, than purely black and white. So on that note, uh, within the Crown Street and the uh, Draft Board Alley area, um, we can see the change over time. So it was decimated in the Blitz, in the bombing here, you have maps going from the 1940s into the 1960s, where you can see this street plan has absolutely changed. And then if we go to the modern day view today, again, you can see that these streets have, have really been kind of obliterated. Now, Another institution uh, that is worth mentioning as well is um, this one here, the Coloured Men's Institute, which was set up at 13 to 15 uh, Tidal Basin Road and was founded in the 1920s. Sadly, um, it, it didn't outlive its founder, Kamal, um, who died in 1953. But it, nothing of it exists today. So if we go to Tidal Basin Road um, in modern London, you can see what a difference. <laughs> As we pan around today, you can see that it is a major road. You have um, luxury uh, new build flats that are being built here just ahead of you is known as the Crystal Conference Center. We have the Emirates airline cable car in the background and then the towering skyscrapers of North Greenwich and of Canary Wharf looking further along. So Tidal Basin Road today, uh, completely unfamiliar. <laughs> but another woman that I want to mention who lived and uh, was born in this area uh, in Silvertown or 
Canning Town uh, was the fantastic Josie Woods. And I'm so sorry that I only have this one tiny image of her. Unfortunately, that's all that we all that we have. Um, it's from a blog post on the East End Women's Museum website, which I encourage you to have a look through for some inspiring women's stories. But Josie Wood was definitely an inspiring uh, figure. So she was born in 1912 and she was the daughter of a Dominican merchant and a white, white self-described gypsy girl of a mother. So she was always gonna have a bit of an eclectic upbringing. Um, at age 14, she was shipped off to Allgate uh, to work in a Jewish, uh, Jewish tailor's shop. This is an image of Allgate High Street at the turn of the 20th century but she didn't stay there for very long because she went to an open audition with her brother Charles um, to basically get into show business. She was a dancer and she clearly had a lot of talent um, because this woman Belle Davis who was a, uh, an American and was traveling around uh, London was hiring dancers and turning them into kind of musical stars and so she plucked uh, Josie and her brother Charles out of the open audition and gave them their first big break so they were put in this kind of tap dancing troupe called the Lancashire Lads which was actually the uh, the group that Charlie Chaplin had started out with as well and they toured around the country and um, were, were kind of living the living the dream. Later Josie and her brother joined another group that were known as the Eight, uh, Eight Black Streaks and they were known as the fastest dancers in the land and they even performed at the London Palladium um, as well. And Josie, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any other kind of images to show you, but I think the next kind of video clip does show you the, the kind of energy that she would have had because she was really inspired by the new dances coming in across the pond from America and particularly by the jitterbug. And she'd heard about it before, but it was the first time seeing it in a cinema in 1937 <clears throat> that she thought, this is for me. So I'm just going to play you um, this clip. Unfortunately, we don't have sound on it, but she saw this in the cinema. She saw the people dancing and she stayed in the cinema the rest of the day, watching screening after screening to basically get excited and learn the moves of these dancers in order to then learn and kind of do the moves herself. And I just love that idea of her getting so inspired and sitting there in the cinema. <clears throat> So she um, went on to have a, a very uh, famous career. She worked in lots of double acts and was traveling around music halls. And we'll actually come back to Josie um, a little bit later on in the tour. So we're about this stage on the map here um, around the Tidal Basin Road. And we're going to just hop a little bit um, further down onto a street called Dock Road, which leads into the Victoria Dock or skirts around it today. Um, again, Dock Road, not really the most aesthetic um, of all London roads. If you walk around here, it's largely industrial estates and cement mixing works, um, totally different to how it would have been in the 19th century with lots of terraced houses and pubs. And it's a pub that we're talking about here. So at number 81, Dock Road, um, you had this pub, the Bell and Anchor. Um, so the, here it's shown in about uh, 1931. And the Bell and Anchor, if we look at the people who were registered as working there, in 1878 is a man called John George Cundy. And Cundy was um, a kind of big brewing family through the generations in the Silvertown area. But I mentioned this one here in 1878 because actually 1878 was an incredibly pivotal year for the East End, in particular this area, because on the 3rd of September 1878, we had something called the Princess Alice disaster. So on the top map, you've got a red dot here, a dock road. And on the bottom map, um, you can see the rough location of this steamship disaster. 
So the Princess Alice um, was a, a pleasure cruiser. It was carrying about 700 passengers who had been out to a day in the seaside. This is upper working class, lower middle class, people, normal Londoners going about having a nice day, just like on a Sunday bank holiday today. And um, another boat, a much larger collier that was carrying coal, plows into it just by North Woolwich. So the perspective we're seeing here in the image is standing aboard the Princess Alice, just as the prow of the other ship is coming towards us, the Bywell Castle. And it, it plows straight through, the ship is broken in two and within two minutes, the boat is sank and the majority of Londoners are in the Thames. Now, at this point, the River Thames at this area in the east of uh, London, it's quite close to an outfall sewer and raw sewage is being pumped into the Thames and this is toxic. So there's a huge uh, rescue effort to get people out of the river, but unfortunately, if you spend really any time in there, um, it's gonna have quite dire consequences. So 650, probably over 650 people lost their lives that day. And I mention it in terms of the pub um, because the, in, in one book written about the pub, he mentions that actually four unfortunate bodies were taken to the pub to be laid out for identification. And bodies unfortunately were washing up on the Thames shore, you know, for days afterwards with people having no idea where their loved ones might have been. So it was an in incredible disaster that I think now perhaps is getting more famous, but certainly because it is, I think, working class and lower middle class doesn't quite have the, the world renown as perhaps it, it deserves. So that's another shot of the, the Bell and Anchor pub there. But back to the women. Um, one of the Kundi family was Sarah Ann Kundi, and she's pictured here in the illustration. Now, um, she was married to one of the landlords of the Bell and Anchor, um, but then she also, in her own right, took over another pub, a pub called the Tidal Basin Tavern where again, in the directories, she's listed as the only resident, so we assume the landlady as well. Now today, this isn't that rare, you know, for, for a woman to be working uh, behind the bar, but we're talking early 1900s. She worked there, she's listed there from 1912 until into the 1930s. And given that it was still, you know, perfectly legally fine, for women to be um, denied service at the bar until 1982. <laughs> it's quite incredible that Sarah ran a pub in one of the roughest areas of London in the early 1900s. So to get an idea, unfortunately, as you've probably guessed, the pub is long gone, um, but to get an idea of, of where it is, we can go to, um, Tidal Basin Road here, this corner of the road, and go back in time on Google Maps to see this stone wall. And if we go back uh, to an image uh, from the early 2000s, 2006, you can see the structure still standing here. So this was the site of the Tidal Basin um, Tavern. Um, sadly, as well, I've explained, like a lot of these areas, um, nothing remains of it today. So we're gonna do another leap now and go from Tidal Basin Road um, to go into Victoria Dock. Now, when the Victoria Dock opened in 1855, it was an instant success. Um, it, it was hugely profitable. It was um, getting about 800,000 tonnes of shipping um, every year, far outstripping the London docks that was closer to the city of London, outstripping them by about four times the amount of cargo being brought in. Um, and so eventually the Victoria docks were actually bought 
by the London docks. Um, but the area was, uh, the, the Victoria docks were home to larger ships, to steam ships rather than sailing ships. And you can get an idea here in the, in the next image, but just as we're looking at the construction, you can see, um, I kind of like the, the rural feel of it. You know, they were building this epic industrial site kind of in the middle of what was just marshes. And you really get a sense of the scale from this incredible aerial view in, um, in 1935 in the heyday. And you can see some of the larger ships in the Victoria Dock. So the Victoria Dock is the larger pool of um, water that we see closest to us. And then you have the Royal Albert Dock and the George V Dock, the two smaller ones, a little further into the distance. And then the rest of the River Thames looping around. And this was the hub of the British Empire. Um, goods from all over the world were being brought into the area and it really specialised in um, chilled meat and grain. Um, and I couldn't resist showing this incredible photo of an elephant being unloaded um, at the Royal Docks as well. So literally anything you could think of was being brought into the Royal Docks in the area here. But let's look at it today. So it has completely changed into more of a sort of pleasure uh, marina. We have the cable car that's overhead. And as we pan around, it's a spot for outdoor swimming. You can even go wakeboarding, um, which we see a, a fella doing on the left hand side here. And the only real industrial reminders are these huge cranes that line uh, the, the former Victoria Dock um, today. So we're now going to walk along the edge of the, uh, of, the, of the dock around the right hand side to head to another industrial landmark um, in the area, which is just further along where the red is circled here. And this is the extraordinary site of the Millennium Mills. Um, here they are in the 1930s. Um, sort of in their, in their heyday. They were first built in 1905 um, as flour mills and they were the predominant source of, of flour for the UK. And um, they were unfortunately largely destroyed in an event in 1917, which I'll get to shortly. And then they were rebuilt rather grandly in an Art Deco style in 1933. And you can see where I'm going with this, only to then be heavily damaged in the Second World War. But Regardless of that, in the 1950s, that was really a boom year for the Millennium Mills. They employed 100,000 workers and a lot of these were women as well. So the men were largely employed in the docks and these factories that were lining the uh, Victoria docks and the rest of the Royal docks really were um, a, a huge employer of women in the area. So here's a view of Millennium Mills now. As the Victoria Docks closed in 1981, um, they became derelict. And really, this was filmed, you know, a few days ago. There is a, a, a plan, a development plan underway. Um, but uh, they, this has been a long time coming since the early 2000s. But they do have a formal plan of redevelopment at the moment. If you were curious as to look inside as well, here's a shot um, from inside the building. It's been completely gutted and it has been used actually for kind of um, music videos and, and filming. Any sort of gritty East End backdrop, you can imagine it fits rather nicely. So from the Millennium Mills, if we go straight down um, in the midst of a, a new build residential quarter in Silvertown, you find um, a curious bit of a history, a reminder of an epic event um, in 1917. So it seems very incongruous now to be in amongst all of these very tidy uh, new build flats overlooking the River Thames across the lawn, which is just ahead of us here. But if you go to this one little corner of the garden, you can see a uh, little memorial. And this is in part a war memorial, but also remembers an event in 1917. And this was the Silvertown explosion. And 
this was happened this happened in a in a factory um that originally before the war was making uh, soda crystals and working with them but after the or during the war the government asked them to basically produce tnt and this was despite concerns being raised um, about the safety of it so in, um, in 1917, at about um, half past six, um, a fire started in, in the factory, um, Bruna Mond, and this fire slowly made its way to about 50 tonnes of TNT. The blast was deafening. People heard it as far away as the east, as the Sussex coast of England. Um, it, within a mile radius, buildings were, were flattened. And it's actually quite surprising that the death toll wasn't higher. 58 people lost their lives. Um, but remember, this was in the evening. So it was a later shift where there wasn't as many people um, who were working in the factory at the time. So Thankfully, it was possibly not as much of a loss of life, although still catastrophic, um, as it perhaps could have been. So um, just to give you a sense of the devastation, this is actually the Millennium Mills that we saw earlier, which was right by the factory. And as you can see, suffered a huge amount of damage. Um, something like 70,000 houses were, were destroyed. Um, and so a lot of people were, were made homeless. But in terms of the kind of women's stories, um, about the Silvertown explosion. Um, Lynn Brown, an, a member of parliament for West Ham, she was talking about her memories um, that, that she had of, of relatives at the time of the Silvertown explosion. And she talks about her grandma, her nan, Catherine Oates, who was known as Katie. She lost her left arm in the explosion. She was hurt as she was walking down the street when the blast occurred. Her brother was killed in the disaster and a young Esther Wilson, an amazing woman who was the local brownie leader from Silvertown, lost her sight. She was a teenager at the time. Her sight was damaged and eventually she went blind and she went away to learn Braille and was still able to run the brownie group in St Barnabas Church. Um, and she was Lynn Brown, the MP's own brownie leader, and she said that she taught generations of local children the correct values in life, and she was really an amazing woman. Um, another incredibly brave person that we should also mention is Nora Griffiths. Um, Nora Griffiths, sorry, we don't have, I don't have a photo of her, um, but Nora um, was working in a, a mission hall um, where there were lots of children on site and because of her holding up the ceiling, stopping it collapsing, she saved all of those children's lives. So another, another name uh, to remember, Nora. So we've just been at the Silvertown Memorial site. Um, originally, this was actually based at a different um, location. The memorial was on the North Woolwich Road, but it was moved here as part of the new development. Um, we're going to do another little leap now. Um, just to explain where the red circle is, we're going to go across to that green patch to get a closer look at something far more modern in the area, the uh, Thames Barrier. So out of the modern development, if we look over into the Thames, um, we can see the, the, the kind of mud flats of the River Thames here. And as we pan to the left, we see the extraordinary uh, Thames flood barrier. So this was finished in around 1984 um, and it protects London still today, uh, central London, from flooding. If you're um, less technically minded than I am, then it essentially works through this diagram here. So at the top, you can see the, um, the kind of barriers actually lie in the ground of the riverbed and then they, they twist and turn up in the process of closing, and then they can return again into the, the riverbed. So these are in the gaps between the silver kind of bastions that you see ahead of you. 
But it's worth mentioning here um, that the, the kind of brains behind it, the person that led the engineering team um, was a woman, was a woman called Mary Patricia Kendrick. And you will not find her on the Wikipedia page or any kind of easy resource um, of the Thames Barrier, which I found most frustrating. But um, Mary, who was born in 1928, she was a British tidal engineer and a, a world-renowned expert in silt, which just sounds fantastic. Um, and she worked closely in London. Um, of course, her main project was the Thames Barrier. To give you an idea of perspective, I mean, she joined the project um, leading the kind of works from 1968. Uh, that's how long ago it was in, in progress before it was finally finished in the mid 1980s. Um, but she also worked in Liverpool on the, on the Mersey River as well. And she was appointed the kind of head uh, conservator of the river, the first woman after 200 men had had that job um, as well. So even though maybe not as far in the past as some of the other women that we're talking about, a, a real tra trailblazer in the engineering world, world. So it's worth remembering Mary Kendrick. Um, from the Thames Barrier, we're going to leap um, sort of inland a little bit more and we're, we're back to really attractive industrial uh, roads. So um, along the greenery here, you have the DLR tracks, the Docklands Light Railway. And as we turn off the main road here, we can see what is left of Charles Street um, that Today, you know, frankly, there isn't a lot to see on Charles Street, but in 1929, a woman called Ethel was born on Charles Street and Ethel, age 14, went to go and work at the Tate and Lyle factory. And she is one of the, the kind of main people that are featured in the fantastic book, The Sugar Girls, which looks at four women who uh, were working in the Tate and Lyle sugar factories in the 1940s and the 1950s. And just as we um, just as we mentioned with Josie Woods earlier, um, Ethel was also mixed race. Her father was a, a merchant from St. Lucia. And, um, and this doesn't really actually get a mention, really. It, it didn't seem to be um, a big part of her life in, in the Sugar Girls book, um, but is interesting in the context that we talked about with, with Crown Street a little earlier. Ethel was actually moved out of um, Silvertown, evacuated um, as, as many younger people were during the Second World War. And then she returned to Silvertown to go to, uh, to live in a different location because her street had been completely decimated by bombs. Um, Ethel also, um, I really encourage you to read the book. We'll come back to that a little bit later to really get a sense of these women's stories, stories that sadly are so often, you know, not told in mainstream history. And Ethel comes across as very much the responsible uh, of, of all of the different sugar girls. She was very good at maths. Um, she had a very, uh, uh, she, she just had a bit of a gift for it. So as soon as she joined up age 14, she was very good at keeping her own running tally of the amount of sugar bags that she packed, so much so that she also kept the tally for any other girls in her eyeline that she knew weren't as, as good with numbers. And this meant that she was promoted um, quite swift, swiftly. So she kind of raised, uh, rose up through the ranks. So moving from Charles Street, um, we're going to continue um, east, heading along the North Woolwich Road um, and just going under this um, kind of the Docklands Light Ra Railway bypass here. Now, along the Woolwich Road, breaking up the sort of monotony of industrial units, you have this fantastic um, survivor, this incredible Victorian church, um, which is by quite a famous uh, Gothic architect from the late 1800s, Samuel Toulon. Um, 
And this from the 1980s was really left to left to rot. This is um, St. Mark's Church. So thankfully, it's it's grade two listed. So it is protected um, and you can get a, a better view of it in this image here. It's, a, it's an incredibly striking building. And from 2003, it's been home to the Brick Lane Music Hall. <clears throat> which if you know London, you'll know that Brick Lane is quite a long way away from here, still in the East End, but closer west towards the city of London. So in 2003, um, Vincent Hayes, who had set up the Brick Lane Music Hall um, in the 1980s, originally, as you might have guessed, it was based on Brick Lane in the old Truman Brewery. He moved it out here as a way to revive this culture and this rich East End culture of a good knees up um, around the piano and at the music hall singing songs together um, and it's um, sadly of course at the moment it was uh, closed as I walked past I'm not quite sure what the what the future of it uh, will be but it, it is worth going to have a look at this because if you peer in the gate there's also an incredible mural which I unfortunately I couldn't find the artist um, online. So if anyone if anyone does know, that would be fantastic. But you can see that you've really got this captured image of these East End streets as they would have been known prior to the Second World War. Pubs on the corner, narrow brick terraces, and then the looming ship in the background uh, of the docks kind of rising over as well. And it is in the Brick Lane Music Hall that we return to Josie Woods. Um, she was recently, um, oh, relatively recently, um, interviewed actually as part of a BBC documentary. I say recently, it was in 1997. Not recent at all, Katie. Um, so in 1997, she was interviewed. Um, at this point, she was still in her, she was in her 80s. Um, and I haven't been able to see the documentary, but I, I imagine that she's still uh, dancing like an absolute trooper. And she, they filmed part of this documentary in the Brick Lane Music Hall, the church that we saw before. And she was talking about um, her life. So as I mentioned, she had a very successful career in the music halls and she later went into films as music halls popularity was dwindling and she played a lot of extras in, in films. So she never really had this stardom in movies, but she definitely knew her worth and she knew her rights. And actually on one film project that she was working on, um, there was a collective um, dismay from the extras that they weren't being paid on time and so Josie took it upon herself uh, to walk up to the management and basically say um, if you don't pay us you can kiss my black ass um, and they paid up so she was basically standing up for everyone's rights on the film um, and making sure that the rest of the extras did get did get paid on time thankfully um, she ended up uh, living into her 90s and she only died quite recently in about 2012, I think, and just seems like what a remarkable woman. So from the, uh, from the St. Mark's Church that we see here, as we pan over, um, we can see, or not quite see, but we can get a sense of these derelict ruins of the former Tay Wharf. Now, unfortunately, the key piece is hiding underneath uh, the, the shrubbery, but with the power of Google Street View, we can roll back the clock and give you an idea of, of what used to be used to be there. So um, if you were to come back sort of a few years ago, you would have seen before the overgrowth, the year 1900 and Tay Wharf that's shown on Street View here. And this was the site of um, a, a, another massive factory and still on a confectionery sugar theme. This was the Keeler Jam um, and Marmalade Factory, another huge employer um, in the area. And the Keeler family, um, it was actually established back in the 18th century in Dundee. It starts with James Keeler, who in the 1740s, um, sort of takes a punt on a shipment 
of uh, Spanish cargo and buys it for a knockdown price. And on board the ships are, are lots of slightly going off Seville oranges. And he kind of takes these back and his mother, uh, Janet Keeler, ever the sort of thrifty and resourceful woman, um, decides that she can make marmalade. Now, this isn't the first time that we ever see an invention of marmalade, but what Janet does that's quite special is she strips off the rind and includes it in the marmalade and she makes it a bit runnier so it's spreadable. And this is something the, the Keeler family continue to produce um, right up into the 20th century. So skipping forward from the 18th century when Janet and James are alive, the new generations of the Keelers set up a factory here in 1888 on the site of uh, Tay Wharf here. And again, <clears throat> this was a, um, uh, a, another big employer of women in the area. So I think it's a bit tenuous to say, you know, Janet was, was one of the wonderful women of Newham, but I'm sure that uh, she replicates the, the um, resourcefulness of, of lots of East End house runners and also uh, workers in the East End as well. So back to the North Woolwich Road, we're, we're whizzing around and we're heading um, in the shadow of another huge factory up ahead, the Tate and Lyle factory. <clears throat> and we're going down what conveniently is called Factory Road. But before we get to Tate and Lyle, um, we can see this building ahead of us, which is now modern flats. And it's the site of two Connaught Road. So again, handily going back in time, we can see what used to stand here. And this was the railway tavern. Um, and this pub, um, which is thought to have been run by the Cundy family as well. So I don't know quite how the relationships work with Sarah and Cundy, who we met earlier, um, but definitely a, a relationship of the brewing family we talked about. But I mentioned this one here as the Railway Tavern purely because it was used for meetings for the gas workers union. So these are people that are employed in the Beckton gas works, which is a little bit further east from here. And the meetings were organised and a huge worker, um, a, a huge organiser of the trade union movement in for the gas workers was this woman, Eleanor Marx, who was the youngest daughter of Karl Marx. And she hosted many meetings in this pub. She was an incredible uh, public speaker and was an in incredibly uh, fastidious and organized organizer of these strike movements. So not only did she work with the, the gas workers, but also she was heavily involved in other East End trade union movements, including the uh, Match Girls strike at the Bryant and May Match Factory in 1888, and the Dock Strike of 1889, uh, the Great Dock Strike um, campaigning for the um, higher wages, the Dockers Tanner, the rate of sixpence an hour. So Eleanor Marx, um, on the other side, she, she actually had quite a tragic life, really. Um, she absolutely was kind of uh, adored her father. They had a really close relationship. And at the age of 16, he hired her as his secretary. So she was clearly very influenced uh, with his socialist views. And um, she uh, essentially um, took up these views and became became an activist, worked tirelessly to, to campaign for um, workers' rights and also uh, women's rights. And again, it's kind of uh, the story a bit like Mary Kendrick of a bit of an unsung hero, really, because um, the leader of the Gas Workers' Union was a man called William Thorne, and he had been very involved in the dock strike of 1889. But the reason he had been able to manage that dock strike is that Eleanor Marx had spent 10 years working closely with him, improving his reading and writing. They say that 10 years earlier, Will Thorne could only ever write his own name. So it was the time spent with Eleanor where she improved 
his skills um, that he was then able to go on and be general secretary of the um, Becton Gas Workers, which is still going um, as a union today uh, with over 60,000 members. Now, Eleanor herself, um, as I mentioned, had quite a tragic um, end to her life. Um, she found out that her husband was cheating on her and she um, took poison and committed suicide at age 43. So unfortunately, um, she, her, her life came to rather an abrupt end. So from the former pub opposite the road, we're going to hop over the railway tracks to look at um, the Tate and Lyle factory. Now, this one here is known as the Thames Wharf uh, factory. There's actually two Tate and Lyle uh, factories, and this led to much rivalry uh, between the workers. So. Tate and Lyle, as you might be able to guess from the name, actually comes from a merger of two separate uh, companies, Tate um, and Lyle. So this one was the major sort of Tate site. It was, um, uh, you can see it here on the right hand side. And there was also another factory um, further west, uh, which was known as the Plasto, factory, uh, Plasto Wharf. Um, and that is by West Silvertown DLR today. And so um, you get a uh, view of that, sorry, here. As you look over the DLR tracks, um, you can see the other site of the Tate and Lyle factory. And this was predominantly associated with the Lyle section. So first of all, Henry Tate um, was on the other side. He had founded his company um, in 1868 and the big seller for Tate sugar was sugar cubes, these super convenient cubed sugar uh, granules that were, that were sold very, very widely. For Lyles, as you can probably see from the detail on the side of the factory here, this was set up earlier in 1833, a man called Abram Lyle, and he, uh, they were famous for golden syrup. So for a while, the two factories existed side by side, but with great rivalry, each of them kind of having an unspoken rule not to replicate a liquid sugar or a cubed sugar. In the 1920s, they could both see that actually it was more sensible for them to merge and combine forces. However, um, they say that Henry Tate and Abram Lyle hated each other, would not speak to each other, and in fact never met, even though they got the same train out of Fenchurch Street in the city of London every single day. They never uttered a word to each other, apparently. And so this rivalry, even though they're the same companies, lived on. And the factory itself, um, just go back to uh, some of the pictures here, the factory itself, this one's a bit better, you can see circled here the St Mark's um, Church and the Tate factory and its chimneys ahead of you. The factories were more than just employers for the women who were part of it. Um, they were a source of independence. They were the best paid in the area and they offered um, extraordinary benefits as well. Um, the social scene was a big part of the experience. They had um, the Tate Institute, the working club where you could go for drinks afterwards. And the so-called sugar girls just sound like the absolute sassiest bunch of women you could ever hope to meet in the in the early 1900s. Um, one woman who worked at uh, Tate and Lyle was a, a woman called Edna Henry. She was the first black employee, um, as far as we know, in, in the Tate and, and Lyle factory. And again, she was not going to take any mistreatment lying down, uh, just like Eleanor, just like Josie, as we've seen, Edna um, was felt that she was passed over for a promotion because of her race and she didn't take it lying down she went straight to management and demanded to know the reason why she had been looked over and then got the promotion and her fellow workers were so impressed by her they voted for her to be their union representative 
And just like we saw kind of at the very beginning with Nora Willis, who kind of gets into the workforce and then realizes actually she's good at this job and she can stand up for herself and she wants to go into um, local politics and into activism. These women were spurred on to, to make sure that they were getting the best situations for themselves. Um, I really do recommend reading the, the Sugar Girls book um, here. It is just so fantastic um, to, to hear the stories um, of these women who have told it through their, through their memoirs, basically. And you really get a sense of the, these women thought it was kind of the golden years of their life. Often it would be before they were married or had children. Depending on your job in the factory, you might have been forced out of your role um, if you were uh, pregnant or if you were going to be married. Um, and so there was this small window where the, these really tight bonds of friendship um, were, were built upon. So we're going to head now um, to our last stop to something that's a little more um, kind of up to date and we're going to zoom over um, into North Woolwich very close to the George V uh, DLR station um, and we're in the middle of a uh, social housing estate and unfortunately um, as has become a theme you can see that the building no longer exists it's now today a laundrette um, but this was used as an office during the 19th 80s by a woman called Connie Hunt and Connie Hunt who you can see here in full flow um, uh, at, a, at a meeting was um, one of the uh, was the kind of founder and the leader of the people's plan and this is after the docks had closed and during the redevelopment and the talks in what we're going to do with these former industrial areas um, the London Docklands Development Corporation wanted to build what today is City Airport and Connie who was a local resident um, fiercely campaigned with a lot of local support against the building of this airport. By researching and garnering public opinion they put forward the People's Plan, a well-researched completely waterproof plan for what the local residents really needed, um, better housing, better um, amenities, better travel connections, um, more care facilities for children and for the elderly. It was such a successful plan that actually a, an independent inquiry said that it was far preferable than the airport. However, the London Docklands Development Corporation were only answerable to the Thatcher government at the time. And so the People's Plan was completely sort of swept to one side despite the, the campaign of it. And as you probably guessed, because City Airport exists today, um, ultimately um, it wasn't successful. But Connie herself, um, this was the kind of pinnacle of her uh, neighbourly activism, and she would forever still stand up for the local community um, in Newham. Um, she only died re relatively recently. Um, in her early life, uh, she proved to be a, a, a very good campaigner as well. Um, when she was a young waitress, she got some notoriety because um, she spilled hot soup purposefully over Prime Minister Winston Churchill after um, he made inappropriate sexual advances towards her. So she was a woman very capable of standing up for herself. And uh, later on, when she was living in a high rise block in Newham, she also campaigned on behalf of the local residents to better the living conditions of her tower block as well. So she was clearly a force to be reckoned with, even if in this situation she wasn't ultimately successful. So thank you so much for, for joining me on the virtual tour today. I hope that some of the stories have, have really inspired you to, to find out a bit more about these, these incredible women and, and places just east of London that often, often get overlooked. Um, do recommend you take a look at the East End Women's Museum. Their website is full of blogs about other inspiring uh, women across London. And yes, thank you very much for joining me.
Thank you, Katie. That was amazing. Um, if anyone's got any questions or comments, pop them in the in the chat box and um, Katie can answer if she can. Um, I'm going to pop some links in the chat box as well for uh, the trails of Canning Town and Silvertown if you want to download those um, and read them and, and enjoy them um, at home or give them a go if you're local. And if you are local, you can pick up some physical copies in the Canning Town uh, Public Library. Um, as Katie says, our museum volunteers have done loads of research around the wonderful women of Newham. Um, so I'll pop a link to the Newham Heritage Month uh, website where you can find more records. Um, and if you'd like to find out a bit more about the museum as well, we're going to be opening our permanent home in Barking in 2022. And we're doing lots of consultations as well. Um, and there's a, an e-newsletter that you can sign up for as well. So I'll pop all those links in. But if you've got any questions or comments, then please add them to the chat or feel free to add yourself. Just to add as well, that I know I mentioned the Sugar Girls. I think you put the details in the chat box here. Yes. Another really good, yeah. um, another really good memoir which I read as well, um, which I really enjoyed, is Silver Town. Um, it's a memoir by Melanie McGrath about the life of her grandmother. I mean, it's pretty heartbreaking and um, pretty sad, but it, it gives you a really honest outlook. And as I said, you know, quite often these stories just don't get told. They're not in mainstream history. So it's really important to kind of hear their voices as well. Thank you so much, Katie. I mean, I, like I'm the programme manager of Newham Heritage Month and yet so much of this was completely new to me. I can't believe how much you've found out about these spaces. It's fantastic. Well, it was thanks to, to your guys kind of, kind of piecing together the early bits of research and then you just sort of deep dive, <laughs> deep dive in. So, um, yeah, it's brilliant that there is little bits of these women. Sometimes it's so frustrating that it's just a name, a date, you know, and an occupation on a directory. So you sort of have to pad out, read around the edges of the context to get a real view of what their lives might have been like. Mm. Definitely. I did um, not I just know that saw... in the marks as well, teaching them yeah. to read, read and write as well. That's never mentioned, is it? No, I know. <laughs> Talk about sort of behind great men. There's a great woman, you know. Um, I just yeah. saw as well about the golden syrup. Yeah, it, it is. I think it was recognised by the Guinness world records recently is like the oldest brand although I would kind of question that because twinings was set up in the 1700s so oh. and they haven't changed so whenever you try and say the oldest or the first there's always some kind of caveat <laughs> it feels like a vote for the uh, east london there though <laughs> that is true that is true we'll, we'll side with them <laughs> thank you so much for all for joining us and thank you so much to east end women's museum and katie wignall for doing such a fantastic job it's a really wonderful way to spend a bank holiday sunday evening thank you everyone have a lovely evening